Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gene Tierney and Cornell Wilde in Leave Her to Heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight you hear, for the first time on the air, 20th Century Fox's powerful screenplay, Leave Her to Heaven. More than 19 million people read Ben Ames Williams' book. Millions more have seen the motion picture, starring the glamorous Jean Tierney, who appears tonight as the over-possessive wife who, who stops at nothing in her desire to be loved as greatly as she loves. Also, from the original screencast, we have a star whose appearance has been requested in so many of your letters, Cornell Wilde. In fact, you might call it the luck of the Irish that enables us to bring you this fine drama on St. Patrick's Day. And speaking of St. Patrick's Day, we received a letter the other day from Mrs. Maeve O'Reilly Finley, a veteran's bride who arrived here in California from her native Ireland just five months ago. She says, It's a long way from the River Shannon to Hollywood and Vine, but a pleasant change from the strong soaps I've been using to Lux Toilet Soap which I discovered on my first week in America. I not only use it for my complexion, but I put a cake of it in my bureau drawers as a sachet because I like the perfume. All our thanks to Mrs. Finley and our sincerest wishes for a happy future in America. Here's tonight's play, Leave Her to Heaven, starring Jean Tierney as Ellen Berendt and Cornell Wilde as George Holland, with Kay Christopher as Ruth. It's an early summer day. On a dock at the head of one of the more remote lakes in Maine, two men watch a boat disappearing in the distance. Well, I hope George Harland is in for some happiness now, Quinton. Heaven knows he's earned a little. He's going to his lodge up there in the woods, eh? Two years in prison. Two years is a long time. We're both lawyers. We know what the law reads. I had hopes of talking with Harland just now pretty obvious he didn't want to discuss it. Can you blame him? No. He holds no grudge. You were district attorney then. You did what you thought was right. Well, I'll be on my way, Mr. Roby. Uh, how about a little fishing? Now? I thought you said the fish never bite here this time of day. They don't. But it's a good place to talk out in the middle of the lake. Quinton, I think it's time you had the whole story on George Harlan. But I thought you didn't want to talk about it either. It's all over now. Come on, let's get a boat. You see, it was through me they first met, George Harlan and Ellen Barrett. He was working on a new novel, and I invited him to stay at my ranch in New Mexico. Ellen and Ruth were coming, too, and their mother. I hadn't thought of them meeting each other on the train, but... Oh, I'm sorry. I was staring at you, wasn't I? Oh, no. Uh, uh, will you have a cigarette? No, thanks. I was staring at you. You see, you look so much like my father. Your father? When he was younger, of course. Do forgive me. Well, I was doing quite a bit of staring myself. Why? Do you really want to know? If it's not too unflattering. Well, while I sat here watching you, exotic words drifted across the mirror of my mind, hmm? and I thought of tales in the Arabian Nights, of myrrh and frankincense and... Uh, uh... And sandalwood? Sandalwood, that's it. Wait a minute. I'm sure the rest of that speech is in this book I was reading. <laughs> Let me find it for you. No, don't bother, please. But it must have impressed you enormously. Oh, no. Well, that book, rather a sloppy job of writing, I thought. I agree with you. You do? You seem disappointed. Well, I should say so. I wrote the book. You wrote? Next stop, Asinta. Asinta, the next stop. Oh, that's me. Excuse me. Huh? Asinta. Oh, but that's me, too. Hey, wait a minute. We all had quite a laugh about their meeting when they ran into each other an hour or so later at my ranch. Ellen introduced George to her mother and sister, and then she made rather an odd statement. And the fact is, Mr. Harland, my mother doesn't like New Mexico at all. But this is my first visit to New Mexico, Ellen. I don't see how you can say such a thing. You see, Mr. Harland, father and I used to come here every spring. Ruth, too, occasionally, but never mother. 
It's too bad Mr. Barron didn't come along this time. I've been told I resemble him. Who told you that? I did. You should be flattered, George, if you knew the devotion between Ellen and her father. His face, his voice, his manner. It's uncanny. Well, if I should ever meet your father... That's hardly likely, Mr. Harland. We've... We've come here for my father's funeral. Oh, I, I'm terribly sorry. I had no idea. Glenn, I... Do you mind if we run up to our rooms? We really should unpack. Of course. Uh... What do they mean, Glenn, about coming here for a funeral? Well, um, as a matter of fact, Professor Barron died some time ago, uh, back east. He was cremated. They brought his ashes here. They're having sort of a ceremony in the morning. Where? In those mountains you saw. There's a favorite spot of his. He used to go there a lot with Ellen. Well, now, let's see about your room. Oh, Ruth. Hello. Ellen's going for a walk. Well, how, how did you know that oh, I... I'm quite psychic. Huh. Is your sister psychic, too? Oh, oh, much more than I am. I'm not her sister. I'm her cousin. But I've lived with the family ever since I was a child. Mrs. Barron adopted me. Ellen started toward the swimming pool. Try that door there by the terrace. Am I intruding? Not at all. I was just about to go back, though. Well, I... I owe you an apology, speaking of your father that way. Oh, please. I... You couldn't have known. You were very close to your father, weren't you? We were inseparable. I imagine dinner's ready, isn't it? Well, after dinner, do you suppose we... I mean, I'd like to... Uh... I'm really quite tired. And I'll have to be getting up at five in the morning. Oh, of course. Uh, that ring, is that an engagement ring? Yes. Yes, it is. Better come along, Mr. Harlan. Glenn's quite fussy, you know, about being on time for dinner. What's the matter with you, George? Fidgety as a hen all afternoon. Well, it's getting dark. Don't you think somebody ought to go and look for Ellen? What for? Well, it's pretty wild in those mountains. She may be lost. Ellen knows her way. Oh, but it's been hours since the... Uh, uh... Please say it. Since the funeral. This scattering of the ashes up there. Well, that was my husband's wish, and it makes my daughters and me happy to have been able to fulfill it. Oh, thank you. Do you suppose Ellen would mind if I rode out and looked for her? No, I don't think she'd mind at all. Run along, if you like. You see, you were worried for nothing. I just wanted to be alone for a while. Well, I'm the one who could get lost around here. We'll be home in a few minutes. Have you forgiven me yet what I said about your book on the train? <laughs> oh, that. I have an altogether different opinion now. I finished the book last night. Oh? I got interested in one of the characters. Which one? The author. Well, I assure you the book's not about me. My father always said every book's a confession. Of course, you have to read between the lines. And did you? Uh-huh. You're a bachelor, 30 years old. Studied painting before you started to write, and you have a large mane called Back of the Moon. Now, wait a minute. Oh, it's all there, you know. What? On the back of the jacket. <laughs> Tell me about your place in Maine. Oh, well, that's... It's just a lodge, that's all. But it's in the most beautiful country I've ever seen. Why do you call it Back of the Moon? Well, there's a lake. It's shaped like a crescent moon. Danny and I used to spend all our summers there. Danny? Oh, my kid brother. He had infantile paralysis a few years ago. He's in Georgia now, you know, at Warm Springs. Is that why you've never married? Because you have to take care of him? No, not exactly. I just never married, that's all. Well, there's the ranch house. While we're still alone, there's a question I'd like to ask you. Why did you ride out after me tonight? I don't know. I guess it was just an impulse. I like people who act upon impulses. They're usually more honest. Ellen... You knew I was coming up there, didn't you? You were waiting for me. That you, Ellen? George? Hi. I said you were waiting for me, weren't you? Yes. You see, I'm honest, too. Chapter 5. The journey into the desert was not remotely... Ruth! Well, good morning. Good morning. What are you doing on that wall? Just pruning the roses. Need any help? Oh, no. Oh, I hope I'm not interfering with your writing. Oh, not at all. I was thinking about you. About me? Yeah, something strange you said the other night. You said you'd been adopted by Mrs. Barrent. Well? Well, you didn't say Mr. and Mrs. Barrent. Weren't you adopted by both of them? Oh, well, yes, of course. Then why did you just say Mrs. Barrent? Oh, I, I don't know. I suppose it was because she suggested that 
Well, she was alone so much of the time. And... Hey, what's the big idea? Glenn told me you were at the swimming pool writing. Well, I am. Then I'll put a stop to it right away. I'm going swimming. Yes. Hmm, that bathing suit. Ellen, I'm delighted to see you. How are the roses, Ruth? Oh, fine, fine. Oh, I've been thinking of you, too, Ellen. What do you mean, of me, too? Oh, because I was also thinking of Ruth. Comparing us? Oh, we're completely different, you know. What were you thinking about when you were thinking about me? Russell Quinton, your fiancé. Who told you his name? Glenn Roby. How did he happen to tell you? I asked him. Why? Because I dislike Quinton intensely. Do you know him? No. Then why do you dislike him? Because he knows you. That's nice. You're going to dislike everybody who knows me? <laughs> Say, you, you've lost your engagement ring. No. I took it off last night, George. For good. Watch out for this flash. <laughs> He wasn't being very fair to you, was he, Quinton? But George was falling in love, not to be judged too harshly. That night we had a visitor at the ranch. You, Quinton. Quite unexpectedly. You. Russell! Well, hello. What in the world brought you here? Your telegram, Ellen. Why all the rush? I wanted to be among the first to congratulate you on your forthcoming marriage. Well, we... We hadn't planned to announce it for a while, but... Oh, George, darling. Yes? This is Russell Quinton. Russell, my fiancé, George Harlan. Uh, well, how do you do? Ellen, might I have a moment with you alone? Certainly. Mother, Ruth, look who's here. Russell. Alone, Ellen. Come on, we'll go in the library. Mrs. Barrett, Ruth, excuse us, please. George, George, is this true? Is what true? What in the world is Russell? You didn't know either. George and Ellen are engaged. Engaged? But, but when and how? Well, and... it... it uh was sudden, believe me, very sudden. It seems that Ellen wired Mr. Quinton last night. I'm sorry, Russ. I, I never expected you to come here in the midst of a political campaign. When do you plan to be married, Ellen? As soon as possible. I'm running for district attorney. It's not going to do me much good for the news to get out that I've been jilted. Oh, Russ. Surely there's no political significance in the fact that a lady has changed her mind. I don't understand it, Ellen. I always knew you'd never marry me while your father was alive, but... I... Ellen, what happened? I'm in love. We intend to be married at once. Tomorrow. Now, don't look so downcast, Russ. I'll still be able to vote for you. Perhaps you don't think I'm good enough for you or romantic enough, but I still love you, Ellen. Thank you, Russ. That's quite a tribute. And I always will. Remember that. Is that a threat? I thought I had a lot more to say, but I haven't. Oh, you might also tell Harland that he's marrying you tomorrow. Judging from the look on his face before, I don't believe he knows about it. Goodbye, Ellen. He's gone, Ellen. Quentin, I mean. Come here, darling. Are you really so surprised? Well, that's not the word for it. I had no idea he'd come here. I... I only knew how much I love you. And I hoped you loved me. I lied to him. We're not engaged, are we? We're not going to be married tomorrow either. Why, oh, you unpredictable little... Ellen, oh, darling, of course we are. Just let me stay in your arms, darling, like this. Always. I'll never let you go. Never, never. Yes, they were married the next day, Quinton. And they left for Warm Springs to see George's brother, Danny. And now Danny's dead, too. And George? George is a man just out of prison. If he only had known. If he only had known. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return with Lever to Heaven, starring Jean Tierney and Cornell Wilde. Lunching at the Brown Derby recently with Hollywood's latest screen hero, Libby. Oh, that you did, Mr. Keeley. And I'll bet many a Bobby Soxer would have envied me my luncheon date with Dana Andrews. 
He makes about the best-looking district attorney one can imagine in 20th Century Fox's new thriller, Boomerang. Well, with Dana in the leading role, there's sure to be romance. Oh, yes, indeed. With lovely Jane Wyatt as a heart appeal. When we got on the subject of beauty, I couldn't help asking Dana what the ideal girl ought to look like. And did you find out? Well, he's the outdoor type himself. A tall, broad-shouldered Texan. Mm. And he admires girls who are unaffected and vivacious, not too sophisticated. Blonde or brunette, he thinks they ought to have that fresh, natural look. Well, lots of American girls could meet those requirements, Libby. Oh, that's right, Mr. Keeley. And in my opinion, there's nothing like a smooth, soft complexion to give a girl that lovely, fresh look. Mr. Kennedy here looks as though he had some thoughts on the subject. Yes? Well, Libby, you know my sentiments about Lux girls. They're winners every time. <laughs> well, screen stars know the appeal of beautiful skin, all right. That's why stars like Jane Wyatt never skip their Lux soap facials a single day. I think any woman who uses Lux toilet soap regularly will agree it's a real beauty soap. An all-round beauty soap, too. Screen stars say it makes a luxurious bath soap, leaves a lovely clinging fragrance on the skin. Why not get some Lux toilet soap, Hollywood's own beauty soap, Tomorrow. Back to your producer, William Keeley. We continue with Act Two of Lever to Heaven, starring Jean Tierney as Ellen and Cornell Wilde as George. Well, Clinton, apart from the newlyweds themselves, I don't suppose anyone was more happy about the sudden marriage than George's younger brother, Danny. As I said, they went at once to visit him. George, oh, George. And Ellen. Oh, <laughs> gee, gosh, I'm I glad to see you. Do you like her, Danny? Because if you don't, we'll send her right back. Oh, don't let him fire me, Danny. I like this job. Don't worry. If he fires you, I'll hire you. <laughs> Thank you. Gee, I, I sure hope you can stay a while. You see, I, I think I'm going to be able to get out of this wheelchair soon. Danny. Well, that's what the doctor says. Of course we're going to stay. We're renting a cottage right here in Warm Springs. It was her idea, Danny. That was the way she wanted it. Ellen. Oh, gee, Ellen, thanks. Well, darling, what's the verdict? How's the soup? Mmm, wonderful. When you hire a cook, be sure and teach her the recipe. Oh, I have no intention of hiring a cook or any other servant. Why not? I don't want anybody else but me to do anything for you. I want to keep your house and wash your clothes and cook your food. A born slavey. I don't want anyone in the house but us. Ever? Ever. Well, but suppose in the natural course of events, we, uh... Well, that's different. And what about Danny, when he's able to leave the sanatorium? Well, that's different, too. Now, hurry, darling. I, I promised Danny I'd come right over after lunch. We're going to have a long visit, just the two of us. It's a wonderful place, Ellen, back of the moon. Say, did George tell you only three people have ever been there? He and I and Luke. Who's Luke, Danny? Well, Luke Thorne. He's uh, sort of a guy. He takes care of the place. Oh, well, here, in the photograph album. Here's his picture. Oh, yes. Oh, speaking of pictures, Danny, you know what I'd like? One of George's baby pictures. Oh, well, heck, there's a whole album full somewhere. A lot of college yearbooks with lots of pictures of them. Only there's one I bet he doesn't show you. Why not? Well, it's a picture of him and Enid Southern. Who's she? Oh, she's the one they voted the best-looking girl. But she's not as pretty as you are, Ellen. And I'm not kidding. Thank you, Danny. Won't it be wonderful when you're all better and can go back to school again? Oh, gosh, yeah. Say, uh, George is pretty busy these days, huh? Oh, yes. That new book of his. I try to keep out of his way, but... He's nuts. <laughs> never mind. With George busy, he'll never even dream of our secret. Now, come on. Let's get to work. Twice across the room today, Mr. Harlan... Here are your crutches. Oh, gosh, Ellen, a, a couple of weeks and I'll be able to forget this old wheelchair for good. Boy, will George be surprised. Steady, my dear, steady. Yes, they got along just famously, Ellen and Danny. George wrote and told me all about them. Then came that wonderful day when Dr. Mason said Danny could leave the sanatorium. Well, it's true, Mrs. Holland. Danny can leave here any time now. I suppose you'll be going directly to Maine, eh? Frankly, Doctor, that's what I wanted to see you about. Yes, we had planned to go, my husband and I. He wants Danny to come with us, and... Oh, and of course I do, too. Well? 
But it's so wild and remote there. There isn't even a telephone in case we need a doctor for Danny. I'm quite sure he won't be needing a doctor. What about his school? School can wait. You're better for him than school, Mrs. Holland. I don't know how you did it, but you practically willed that boy to get out of his wheelchair and walk. But don't you see, Doctor? My husband will be busy writing, and with nobody else around... No one else? I thought Danny spoke of a caretaker. Oh, yes. Well, well, he's leaving, and... Well, I'm... I'm only thinking of Danny, and I... No. I'm thinking of myself, too. I know you'll understand, Dr. Mason. I, I gave up my honeymoon so that my husband could be here with his brother... But he's been working, and the burden's been on me. I've been glad to do it. I love Danny, but after all, he's still a cripple. Mrs. Harland. I'm sorry. I I didn't mean to say that. I'm sure you didn't. I'm afraid I haven't been too well lately myself. Mrs. Harland, what do you want me to do? I want you to tell my husband that it would be better for Danny to stay here. But that isn't so. But surely it could do no harm for him to stay here, and if you'll only tell my husband... Why don't you tell him? Because coming from you, it would... Excuse me. Yes? George... Darling, come in. Danny's nurse said you were here, so I... Oh, George, I've got such wonderful news. Dr. Mason has just consented to let Danny come with us to Maine. Well, Quinton, a week later, they passed by this very spot on their way to back of the moon. What you just told me about Ellen's talk with Dr. Mason... You don't believe it? I have a letter from Mason. If you'd care to see it sometime... I... No... No. Anyway, they settled down at the lodge. Ellen was quite a busy girl. She was always the first one up in the morning. That is, uh, except Luke Thorne. Thorne? I thought you said he was leaving. Yes, he, uh, he was. But not yet. Well, morning, Miss Harlan. Tell me, Luke, who gets up first? You or the sun? Oh, I just thought you'd like me to fix breakfast this morning. Oh, no, that's my job. Gosh, Mrs., I'm beginning to feel like a fifth wheel around here. You mustn't feel like that. Why, George considers you part of this place. You know, you two must have had wonderful times together. Hmm, tolerable. Has he changed much, Luke, from from when he was a boy? Mm, not especially. Here, here, I'll get the bacon. Oh, thank you. Luke, did he ever tell you about Enid Southern? Who? That girl, Enid Southern. Well, who was she? Oh, no one in particular, I guess. Oh, don't set the table, Luke. I'll get at it right away. Yes, ma'am. Luke, do you dream a lot? Dream? Heck no. I had the most awful nightmare last night. I, We were out in the boat, my husband and I, and he jumped in for a swim. Suddenly, he, he went under. I tried to row to him, but the lake was like glue. The boat wouldn't move. My, my arms were paralyzed. Hey, that was some dream. I saw him disappear. I was helpless. Well, I... Uh... Reckon there was only one way for you to save his life, missus. How? For you to wake up. (laughs) (laughs) That's just what I did, Luke. Well, I guess we're ready for breakfast now. Danny! George! Come and get it! Will you marry me, he said, as he... George! Good grief, no. Hmm? Well, what's wrong with that line? Well, in the first place, men never propose. They may think they do, but it's really the women. (laughs) Who told you that, Ripley? And if men do propose, they never say, will you marry me? Did you ever propose to a woman? (laughs) Hundreds of them. Fine. And when you proposed to Enid Southern, did you... Who told you about Enid Southern? Did you say, will you marry me? I didn't propose to her. Did she propose to you? They beat it, will you? How did you propose to me? I, uh... You didn't. I proposed to you. Remember? Okay, and I'll marry you right after I finish this chapter. Oh, I hate your chapters. They take up too much of your time. It isn't as if you had to write. I've got more than enough money for both of us, and, darling, it's the dearest wish of my heart to support you. Now she tells me. And my next dearest wish is is to kiss you. There, right on the end of that sunburned nose. (laughs) Oh, darling, I... I didn't know it would be so wonderful here. You do like it, don't you? Every minute. If only it weren't so crowded. Crowded? Well, there's Danny's room on one side of us and Luke's room on the other and... Well, at least nobody snores. Do you know we've never been alone, not really alone, for a single day? And do you know that Luke moved his cotton things out to the boathouse this morning? He did? Oh, George, I hope you didn't tell him that I... Of course not. It was his own idea. And as far as Danny's concerned... Where is Danny? He went with Luke. Well, where's Luke? Oh, uh, he went to town. You don't mean they're going to stay in town? Oh, no, certainly not. 
Then why did they go? Did you have to know everything? Tell me. Uh-uh. Tell me? <laughs> hey, cut it out. Stop tickling. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Stop it. It's a secret. <laughs> you can't have any secrets from me. <laughs> here, here, then. Here, take the binoculars and look. Binoculars? Look at what? Why, down the lake there. See, there's a boat. Yes, I see. It's our boat. And George! My mother! My mother and Ruth! Well, we wanted to surprise you, darling. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Well, enjoy your swim, Ruth? Oh, it was wonderful. Everything's wonderful here. Oh, Ellen, you should see Danny in the water. He's sensational. Yes, I know. What were you saying, Mother, about Russ Quinton? Oh, just that his election as district attorney is assured. The other candidate withdrew. How nice for him. George, Danny and I found some wild wisteria. Do you suppose we could plant some around the lodge? Well, of course. I'll tell Luke to... Darling, I'm afraid Luke has his own work to do. Oh, he well, what I... what I can do. Luke taught me. What are you doing with your crutch, Danny? Ha-ha, <laughs> never you mind. Now, give me your shoulder, George. Now, watch everybody. I can balance my crutch on one foot. You look. Now, watch it, Danny. What? It's okay. I didn't fall. Well, I'll try it again. Now, I... Excuse me, please. I'll see you all later. Darling, what's the matter? Ellen! Did I... Did I do something? Of course not. Danny, come on, kid. Show me where that wisteria is. Mother? She's losing no time, is she? Oh, now, wait. Ellen didn't expect us. It was a surprise. We shouldn't have come, Ruth. We shouldn't have come. Ellen? Darling, I ask you a question. What's wrong? Please, George, it's, it's late. I'd like to get sleep. But I've got to know, dear. Ever since Ruth and your mother arrived, you've been acting, well, pretty badly, Ellen. I wasn't expecting guests, George. But I thought you'd be pleased. Don't let's quarrel. And then at dinner tonight, Luke, you treated him like a servant. Well, isn't he? Certainly not. He's one of my best friends. Is Ruth one of your best friends, too? Ruth is your own sister. She is not my sister. All night long, you devoted yourself exclusively to her. Well, someone had to make her feel at home. Maybe you're in love with her. You're in an awful mood, Ellen. Maybe that's why you invited her up here. Please, do you want her to hear you? I keep forgetting you can't draw a deep breath in this room without being heard all over the place. I mustn't disturb Mother and Ruth, must I? Or wake up Danny. Ellen, what's got into you? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, darling, forgive me. I, I'm sorry. I, I can't help it. It's only because I love you so. I love you so I can't bear to share you with anybody. Ellen. Oh, it's all right, darling. It's all right. Well, the gal with the hoe. How's the wisteria doing? Well, I finally got them all planted. Say, they look swell. Oh, I'll bet anything would grow here. It's much harder to grow things where we live. George, when are you going to visit us at Bar Harbor? Oh, when the book's finished, maybe. Oh, you'd like it there. Your mother and I thought it might be a good idea for Danny to go back with us. He'd have a grand time. Yes, I'm sure he would, Ruth. Well, if you'll excuse me, your mother wants to see me. She's been reading my manuscript. And I... As far as I've read, George, it's splendid, really. Well, just for that, I'd, I'd thought of dedicating the book to you, to my sweet, discerning mother-in-law. Who... Who, who advised me to dedicate this book to my wife. I'll dedicate the next one to her. You must dedicate them all to her. I hope you'll send me the rest of the story, George. Oh, with only three more chapters. I'll wind them up before you leave here. That's hardly likely we're going Saturday. Saturday? Well, there are reasons why we must be getting home. Does Ellen know this? Yes. What's wrong with her, Mother Berend? There's nothing wrong with her, George. It's just that she loves too much. She can't help it. She loved her father too much, too. Let's not row, Danny. Let's just drift. So nice, just drifting. Yeah. Tell me some more about the place at Bar Harbor, Ellen. Oh, you'd just love it, Danny. There are a lot of rocks on one side of the beach, and when the tide's low, you can watch the anemones and the ink squid. Sure and... sounds swell. Ruth talked about you again in her letter this morning. They'd just love to have you there. Oh, I'd love to go with, with you and George. Well, you don't have to wait for us, Danny. Well, I'd rather wait. We wouldn't be separated for long. Just a few weeks and maybe... No, I'd rather wait, really. Of course, Danny. 
Say, uh, can I swim all the way across the lake today? Wait a minute. Well, I did three quarters yesterday, didn't I? And I wasn't a bit tired. But I, I guess it's all right. Uh, Ellen, if I do it today, could we show George tomorrow? Why not? And we don't have to tell him how long we've been practicing, do we? Well, here I go. You ready? All ready. Water's not too cold. Boy, it's fine. Well, I'll head straight across the lake from here. Don't worry about your direction, Danny. I'll keep you on your course. Okay. Just be careful, Danny. You don't have to swim it today, you know. Halfway to the point yet? Not yet. You're slowing down, Danny. Are you all right? Oh, a little winded, I guess. You'd better float for a while. Yeah, I guess I'd better. Yeah, I wonder where old George is. Hope he doesn't see me. Don't worry. He got it. He's got his nose in that story of his. Why? Well, I think I'm getting a little tired, Ellen. Then keep floating. You don't want to give up when you've come so far. Okay. I'll get my second win with... Gosh. What's the matter? There, there must be a spring here. The, the water's much colder all of a sudden. Ellen. Swim out of it, Danny. Ellen, I must have eaten too much lunch. Here's a cramp, Ellen. I've got a cramp. That's nonsense, Danny. Keep swimming. Ellen, come here. Run towards me, please, Ellen. Help me, please, Ellen. Please. Danny. Danny. Gone. He's gone! George! George! We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return to, with Lever to Heaven, starring Gene Tierney and Cornell Wilde. It gives us, who are veterans in the motion picture industry, genuine pleasure to see an ambitious young player make the difficult grade to stardom. Last May on this program, we introduced you to Miss Martha Heyer, then an RKO starlet. Now she's playing the lead in a forthcoming picture. How does it feel to be a star, Martha? Just wonderful, Mr. Keeley. Working in pictures will always give me a big thrill. Even now, I spend all the time I can watching new productions being made. Seeing the work of the top Hollywood stars is always an inspiration, isn't it? Oh, yes. It was fascinating to watch stars like James Stewart and Donna Reed making the Liberty Films production of Frank Capra's delightful picture, It's a Wonderful Life. And then I was lucky enough to be working at RKO when they were doing Sinbad the Sailor. It's in Technicolor, and the sets were gorgeous. The Arabian Nights brought to life again. <laughs> exactly. With two wonderful stars, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Maureen O'Hara. You know her, Mr. Kennedy, so you can imagine how perfectly cast she would be as a fairy tale heroine. Marina Hera is one of our most glamorous stars. One of our loveliest Lux girls, too. I know she's a Lux girl, Mr. Kennedy, because she told me so herself. Not that I was surprised. Ever since I was a youngster, I've known that Lux toilet soap is tops in Hollywood. Nine out of ten screen stars depend on it as the right care for delicate complexions. Including, I'm sure, Miss Martha Heyer. I certainly am included, Mr. Kennedy. Even before I got into pictures, I always used Lux Toilet Soap as my only beauty aid. I'd say the results of that simple beauty care of yours are highly gratifying, Miss Heyer. Uh, maybe you'd tell our audience just how you use Lux Toilet Soap for that lovely complexion. Here's my active lather facial, Mr. Kennedy. I cover my face with the rich Lux Soap lather and work it well in. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and pat dry with a soft towel. It's an easy care, but it certainly works. Thank you, Miss Martha Heyer, for telling us how effective this simple beauty care can be. In recent tests by skin specialists of these facials, three out of four complexions improved in a short time. Fragrant White Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own complexion soap. Mr. Keeley returns with Act Three of Leave Her to Heaven, starring Jean Tierney as Ellen and Cornell Wilde as George. Glenn Roby, friend and lawyer of George Harlan, continues his story. 
At his side is the former district attorney, Russell Quinton. You were in love with Ellen yourself, Quinton, but I promised you facts. And there they are. From here on, perhaps you're as well acquainted with what happened as I am. No. No, there's still a lot I don't know. Well, um, Danny's death was a tremendous blow to George. After the funeral, he and Ellen went to Bar Harbor, to Ellen's mother and Ruth. A few months later, though, George was like a new person. Ellen was going to have a child. I know you've been worrying about me, Mother Barrett, but that's all over now. From now on, you worry about Ellen. Dr. Saunders says she's fine, George. Well, she's got to take care of herself. Say, this room is going to be great. How do you think these curtains look? Swell, Ruth. You'd never know this was once a laboratory the way you fixed it up. Oh, then how about a rug? You don't put rugs in children's rooms. You use linoleum. It washes easier <laughs> just in case. <laughs> you think of everything, don't you, Ruth? You know, Ellen, I thought you were resting. Oh, Ellen, you shouldn't have climbed those stairs. You know what the doctor told you. What have you done to Father's laboratory? Oh, we didn't want you to see it until it was all finished. What have you done with his things? Oh, we stored them in the basement, Ellen. Why didn't you consult me? I didn't want this room changed, ever. I wanted it left just as it was. I know you don't like being surprised, dear, but we only wanted to please you. Come on, Ellen. Everything's so wonderful again. Is it, darling? Then I am happy. I love you, George. I love you. For heaven's sake, please listen to what Dr. Saunders is trying to tell you. You've got to get more rest, Ellen. Stop being so blamed athletic. You're going to have a child in three months. Mother, where's George? He went into town. Did Ruth go with him? Yes, I think so. Ellen, I said you've got to stop gadding about. I heard you. I can't do anything. I can't go anyplace. I hardly even see my husband. Why not? Well, I, I don't want George to see me this way. Nerves, Ellen, nerves. Just remember what I said. No running up and down stairs and plenty of rest. Wasn't that the front door, Mother? Hmm? Oh, yes, I think it was. They're back, then. I'd like to see Ruth. Of course, dear. Coming, Doctor? I'll send her right up. And what did you and George do all afternoon, Ruth? Oh, just shopped around for the baby things. You were gone for hours. What did you talk about? Lots of things. Danny? No. Me. You know, I've never seen you look so happy, Ruth. Tell me, do you think George loves me? Ellen. He loved me in the beginning, Ruth. But I'll tell you something funny... He never liked me. We've never really been friends like you and he. And now this. A baby. I don't want a baby. George and I never needed anyone but ourselves. Ellen, how can you say such things? Because it's the truth. You're afraid of the truth, aren't you, Ruth? I'll, I'll tell George to come up. No. I'm going downstairs. Where's my lipstick? Ellen, didn't the doctor tell you that... I'll wear that new negligee. George likes me so much in gray. Yes. And then I'll go downstairs. Ellen, darling, you're not coming downstairs. Why not, George? But you're supposed to be lying down. Please, you... Do you like my new negligee, dear? It's new and I... Oh! Ellen! Ellen lost the baby, Quinton. The fall downstairs. She was weeks in the hospital. But when she came home, she seemed quite her normal self again. Cheerful, gay. Have a good swim, Ellen. How's the ocean? Wonderful. What's this package? Oh, it just came. I imagine it's George's new book from the publisher. Oh, good. Where's everybody? Well, George has gone for a walk and, uh, and Mother's in her room. Again? Why does she act like a hermit? Why don't you ask her? She won't talk to me. I... I can't imagine what's come over her. Oh, the, there was a phone call for you before, from a travel bureau. You leaving us? Well, yes, I, I just thought I'd get away for a while. To Mexico. Mexico? Where in Mexico? Tosco. I've heard about it, and I... When are you going? Next week. What are you running away from, Ruth? Is it me? Ellen, why must you say things like that? Is it George? Well, if you must know, it's because I can't stand living here any longer. The whole house is filled with hate. Your hate. Not hate, Ruth. Love. George's love for me. All those weeks I was in the hospital, you had, you had him to yourself, but it didn't do you any good, did it? He loves me more than ever. That's what you can't abide. That's why you envy me, isn't it? Ellen, all my life I've tried to love you. All of us have. Mother and father and now George. And what have you done? 
With your love, you've tortured and crushed us all. No, Ellen, I don't envy you. You're the most pitiful creature I've ever known. Have a nice walk, George. Oh, hello, darling. Your book's here from the oh. publisher. How's it look? Oh, beautiful. I noticed the dedication. See, to the gal with the hoe. Huh? Oh, oh, yes. I'd hoped you'd dedicate it to me. Oh, well, there'll be other books. Darling, I had no idea the background was Mexico. When did you change it? I did a lot of revising. Why didn't you tell me? George, is something wrong? You're so strange lately. Whatever it is, can't you share it with me? We haven't done that for a long time, darling. Shared things. Ever since Danny... You've never forgiven me for that, have you? You've always blamed me. Ellen, please. You did tell me not to let him swim the lake unless you were with us, but, but we wanted to surprise you. Ellen. Danny'd been doing so well. He was sure he could make it. I never dreamed there was any danger. Oh, it was like a nightmare. It just seemed to happen, is that it? Like when you fell down the stairs, as if you'd suddenly had no control. Yes, yes. Then I screamed for help for you, and I began to paddle, but the boat didn't seem to move. And so you let him drown, didn't you? Didn't you? George, you're hitting me. What really happened that day at the lake? You'd got rid of everyone else, your mother, Ruth, Luke Thorne. There was only Danny left. What happened? Did he refuse to leave? Don't, George, don't. Was that why you killed him? You're a perfect swimmer. Oh, you dove in, of course, but that was too late then. You let Danny drown, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, yes, I did, and I'd do it again. I didn't want him around. I didn't want anyone but you. I must have known it all along. But I couldn't believe it. How could I? You loved me, you said. Wanted only to make me happy. Yes, yes, that's all I ever wanted, George. Your happiness. I didn't mean to let Danny drown. I, I thought if he were gone, you'd have only me, and suddenly he was gone. I was sorry then and frightened. I, I tried to find him, honestly. Tried hard, but it was too late. Oh, why don't you kill me, George? You could so easily, you know. And the baby. You never wanted it, did you? No. Oh, don't you see, George? I just wanted to be with you. I couldn't stand having anyone between us. I love you so, George. What was it your mother said? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Ellen. It's just that she loves too much. Ellen, I'm leaving you. <laughs> George went to New York that night. The following night, he had a frantic telephone call from Ellen's mother. They'd gone on a little picnic that afternoon. Ruth, Mrs. Barrett, and Ellen. Suddenly, Ellen had been stricken desperately ill. George, of course, rushed back to Bar Harbor. George. I'm going to die, George. I'm going to die. Well, don't even think of such a thing, Ellen. I'm not afraid. Only... Only promise me one thing. I, I want to be cremated like my father. And my ashes scattered in the same place. Remember? Yes, I remember. Promise? Of course, Ellen. Only... I'll never let you go, George. Never, never, never. As you know, Quinton... Ellen died a few hours later. Yes, I know. And one week later, we were both in a courtroom. Ruth Berendt was indicted for murder, and you, representing the state of Maine, were standing in front of a jury. We'll prove that on the afternoon of September 5th, at a picnic attended by her mother and her adopted sister, Ellen Harland was given a fatal dose of poison. We will further prove that Ruth Berendt deliberately and diabolically plotted and carried through this murder. Now then, Mr. Catterson, as a chemist, you analyzed the contents of this envelope. What did you find? A mixture of sugar and arsenic, sir. Shortly after you made your test, I came to you with a sealed parcel. Yes, sir. It contained a bottle, half filled with a white powder. Is that the bottle on the exhibit stand? Yes, sir. Uh, what is in it? Pure arsenic. Your witness, Mr. Roby. No questions. Very well. The next witness, please, Mr. Thomas Metcraft. It's Thomas Metcraft. Try not to worry, Ruth, please. Oh, I just... I can't understand. I, I can't understand. Mr. Metcraft, you are the manager of the Bay State Mortuary? I am. Were the remains of Mrs. Ellen Harland cremated at your establishment? 
They were. Who made the arrangements, please? Why, the defendant, Ruth Barrett. Your witness, Mr. Roby. No questions. No questions? Very well, Mr. Frank Carlson, please. Mr. Frank Carlson. Who's Carlson? President of the bank. Oh. Bank? What does the bank got Something to do about with... Ellen's will, I think. We'll know in a minute. What was that, Mr. Carlson? I said the bank is trustee of the estate of the late Ellen Barrett. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Holland, sir? Three weeks ago. She wanted to check over her will. Did she make any provision about being cremated after her death? No, she did not. What provision did she make? She requested that she be buried in the family vault at Mount Auburn Cemetery. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, in the three days this trial has been in progress, I have purposely refrained until this moment from placing a most important witness on the stand. Well, he is now about to testify. The husband of the deceased, Mr. George Harlan. Mr. Harlan, why do you suppose the death of your wife was so quickly investigated? I don't know. I understand you went to the police yourself. Yes, and in case you don't know why I went, I offer you this letter. Do you recognize the handwriting? Yes, it's Ellen's handwriting. And the date, sir? September 2nd. Yes, the day before she was poisoned. All right, read the letter aloud, please. Dear Russ, I'm writing this because we once meant a great deal to each other, and there's no one else I can turn to. George is, George is leaving me. Continue. It was after I left the hospital that I noticed a change in George. I thought it might be due to the loss of our child, and then the terrible truth began to dawn on me. George and Ruth. They love each other, Russ, and want to get rid of me. When George suggested a divorce, I begged Ruth to give him up. She refused. She said she'd stop at nothing. I told her I would never give him a, give him a divorce. And it was then that Ruth threatened to kill me. There'll be order in this court. Finish the letter, Mr. Harlan. I know Ruth means it. She will kill me the first chance she gets. She will kill me the first chance she gets. Mr. Harland, you know what Ellen meant when she said that she and I once meant a great deal to each other? I know that Ellen and you were once engaged. Yes. Did you know that when you first met Ellen? Well, she was wearing a ring. And in spite of that, you made love to her? Uh, I suppose so. How soon after this were you married? Two or three days later. Was the defendant Ruth Berent at the ranch in New Mexico during this... this whirlwind courtship? Yes. Where did you go after leaving New Mexico? To Warm Springs to see my brother, Danny. Did Ruth Berent visit you during this time? No. Where did you go next? To a lodge I own here in Maine. Who came with you? Ellen and my brother. Uh, when was that? In June last year. You and your wife were happy? Yes. How about July? Yes, of course. How about August? Did anyone visit you in August? Yes, Ellen's mother and Ruth. But you loved Ellen in August. Well... How about August? My brother was drowned in August. Yes, I know how that must have saddened you. But did it affect your love for Ellen? My brother meant a great deal to me. So did Ellen? Yes. Well, let's skip a few months then. Did your love for Ellen continue when you were living in Bar Harbor? Yes, yeah, in a different way. What does that mean? Well, we would have a child. And because of that, your love for Ellen increased? No, not exactly. It grew less? I don't know. You don't know? During this time, you were living in the Berent residence? Yes. Ruth Berent was there all the time, and your wife was confined to her room? A good part of the time. You saw Ruth a great deal, I suppose. Naturally, the same house. But when did you stop loving Ellen? I don't know. Is it a fact or not that shortly before your wife's death, you quarreled with her? Yes, I did. About what? I can't answer that. Because Ellen was jealous of Ruth. She had no reason to be. But was she? Ellen was jealous of everyone. Was she jealous of Ruth? I refuse to answer that. Then perhaps you'll answer this. Are you in love with Ruth? We're very good friends. Are you in love with her? I'm very fond of it's her. It's a very simple question, Mr. Harland. Are you in love with Ruth? Are you in love with Ruth? Very well. You may step down. Gentlemen of the jury, may I show you a book? It is George Harland's latest novel. Please notice the dedication page. Now, if you'll pass the book among you, I'd like to recall the defendant to the stand if the court and Mr. Roby have no objections. Mr. Roby, no objections, Your Honor. Uh, that book, Miss Berend, you are familiar with it and the dedication. Do you recall how it reads? To the gal with the hoe. Uh, that refers to you? It does. He dedicates his book to you instead of to his wife. Why? I don't know. I, I don't think Ellen was very much interested in the book. But you were? Yes, I, I helped George with some of the revisions. Was that while Ellen was in the hospital? 
Yes. Where does most of the action take place in that novel? In Mexico. A place called Tasco. Have you ever been to Tasco? No. But you had planned to go there, hadn't you? Why? I wanted to get away. So you could be joined there by someone you knew? No. Did George Harland suggest you go to Tasco? No, never. All right. Let's change the subject. Let's talk about this bottle here, Miss Berendt. The one Mr. Catterson testified contains pure arsenic. Ever see this little bottle before? I suppose so. There were many similar bottles in Professor Barron's laboratory. You had access to them? Well, they were in the basement of the house. I, I imagine anyone would have access to them. Uh, now for the picnic. You took food to the picnic in that uh, wicker hamper. Who prepared the food? We both did. Ellen and I. Who prepared the sugar? Who put it in the envelope? I don't know. It, it must have been Ellen. Why must it have been Ellen? Because she was the only one to take sugar with her coffee. Thank you. But who served the coffee at the picnic? I did. And you handed her the sugar? Yes. Well, that is, I, I handed her the envelope. Well, I assumed it contained sugar. And that night, Ellen was dead, and the very next day, her body was cremated. <gasps> oh, yeah. And the following day, George Harland left with the ashes to dispose of them somewhere in New Mexico. Not somewhere. It was a very definite place. Nevertheless, it was no longer possible for an autopsy to be performed to determine the exact cause of death. Well, Ellen had asked to be cremated. She wanted her ashes scattered with those of her father. Then why did she specify in her will that she wanted to be buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery? <laughs> I can't answer that, Mr. Quinton. I don't know. There are a great many things you can't answer. You can't answer how the poison got into the envelope containing the sugar. You can't answer why you made plans to leave this country shortly before your sister was poisoned. Well, perhaps you can answer this. When did you first fall in love with George Harland? When did you tell him you were in love with him? All right. Did you ever tell him that you loved him? No. When did you fall in love with him? Was it after his brother was drowned? After the death of his stillborn child? Did you love him a month ago, a week ago? Do you love him now? Yes, yes, I am in love with him. I think I've always loved him. That is all, Miss Berent. Will George Harlan take the stand? Your Honor, I beg a recess. Miss Berent is ill. She's fainted. Mr. Roby, I have no wish to continue if the defendant is ill. Miss Berent is quite recovered, I believe. Let's get on with this, Mr. Quinton. You have a witness on the stand. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Harland, a half hour ago you heard the defendant finally admit the truth. She is in love with you. And now I want the truth from you. Are you in love with her? Are you in love with the woman who murdered your own wife? What I have to say I could have told you before... I've hoped desperately that it could remain unsaid. I asked you a question. Are you in love with the woman who murdered your own wife? My wife was not murdered. My wife killed herself. So, you honestly believe Ellen committed suicide? Yes. Knowing her as you did and as I did, you think her capable not only of committing suicide, but of falsely accusing her adopted sister of her murder? Ellen was capable of anything. You actually want the jury to believe that she was that sort of monster? Yes, she was that sort of monster. A woman who sought to possess everything she loved. Who loved only for what it could bring her. Whose love estranged her own father and mother. Who, by her own confession to me, killed my brother. Killed her own unborn child. And who is now reaching from the grave to destroy her sister. Yes, Mr. Quinton, Ellen was that sort of monster. And there is someone, I suppose, who will substantiate these unspeakable accusations. Yes, I will. Her own mother. Well, <laughs> The jury might have doubted George's testimony, Quinton, but there was no doubt after Ellen's mother stepped from the stand. It meant branding the memory of her own daughter forever. But, um, and how long was it, Quinton, that the jury took to bring in the verdict? Eight minutes, wasn't it? Not guilty. And Ruth was free. Ruth was free, and I resigned as district attorney. But it was too late to help George Harland. In withholding knowledge of Ellen's crime, he'd become an accessory. Two years in prison. But Ellen had lost. I guess it's the only time Ellen didn't come out first. Well, it's getting dark. George, you'd just about be at the lodge by now. But Ruth. Where's Ruth, Mr. Roby? Where? Where she has been for two years? At the lodge waiting for George to come home. Home? I guess that's a good place for me, too. Let's go, Quentin. (laughs) 
We hate to see the curtain fall on two such fine performances, but we have the consolation now of meeting them as they are in real life. Jean Tierney and Cornell Wilde. Jean, it shows great talent for anyone as gentle-natured as yourself to play a role like Ellen. Well, it's the kind of role I like, Bill. It gives you a lot more chance at dramatic acting. And Jean's character improves a little in The Razor's Edge. Yes, I saw the picture when it was first screened out at 20th Century Fox. You gave a great performance, Jean. Thank you, Bill. And, of course, Cornell is now an idol among many millions of fans, a few hundred of whom are milling outside our theater right now. <laughs> Well, he'll have even more fans after they see him in his next Fox picture, Home Stretch. What sort of a part do you play, Cornell? Oh, happy-go-lucky character who makes money on the races. Makes money on the races? Well, you see, I have a system. Well, how about letting us in on it? All right. I put a dollar on the horse's head and a dollar on his tail, and I'm bound to make money no matter how he comes in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to remember that for the Irish sweepstakes. Which reminds me, you're part Irish, aren't you, Jean? That's right, Bill. What part, Jean? Well, I'd say Jean has a typically Irish nose and a typically lovely Irish complexion. Well, if the lad is so, I owe it all to Lux Soap, Bill. It certainly has done its bit for my complexion. I use it all the time. Thanks, Jean. Most lovely screen stars feel the same way. I'm sure your audience is eager to hear the news about next week's Bill, Bill. Next Monday night, we bring our audience a thrilling classic of the West, one of the most popular stories of its kind ever filmed. It's 20th Century Fox's recent screen hit, Smokey. And our stars are Joel McRae and Rita Johnson. Smokey is more than the life story of a horse. It's a saga of the rough-and-tumble West, of ranch life and romance in which the horse is king. Smokey should make a great treat for your listeners, Bill. Congratulations and good night. Good night, good night. and many, many thanks. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater brings you Joel McRae and Rita Johnson in Smokey. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Here's news for housewives. Your butcher is now offering a much higher price per pound for your used kitchen fats. The world's supply of fats is desperately short, and fats and oils are needed to make household items we all want. Soap. Tires, washing machines are just a few. Every drop of used fats you turn in helps. Remember, you now get a generous price for every pound. Kay Christopher is currently appearing in RKO's production of The Locket. Heard in tonight's cast were Gail Gordon as Quinton, Alan Reed as Roby, Tommy Cook as Danny, and Louise Lorimer, Tim Graham, Norman Field, Bill Johnstone, Alex Gary, and Charles Seal. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Lever to Heaven has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Hollywood's own beauty soap, the complexion care used regularly by nine out of ten lovely screen stars. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Smokey with Joel McRae and Rita Johnson. Spry. When you bake and fry, spry. for your cake and pie, spry. it's your shortening by Reliance Spry. Yes, it's pure all-vegetable spry for delicate, nut-sweet pastry, crispy, digestible fried foods, lighter, richer cakes. The spry way makes all baked and fried foods better tasting. Reliance Spry. S-P-R-Y. Reliance Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Smokey with Joel McRae and Rita Johnson. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.